Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Diane Mossett. Um, some of you have been reading my credentials. I'm really I'm a clinical neuropsychologist. I'm actually trained in both pediatric and adult uh, clinical neuropsychology. Uh, by virtue of my clinical training, I've gotten involved in some forensic cases. So I've uh, retrained as a forensic psychologist as well. Um, I bring that up because um, I'm going to touch a little bit, and certainly if you have questions, uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, uh, certainly one of the diagnostic domains where individuals frequently can come in contact um, with law enforcement and find themselves in legal situations. Um, so uh, I just want to put that out there, so uh, that's what I do. So I'm going to be talking to you today about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Hopefully I'll be able to figure, figure out my... Uh, computer and slides here. So, um, first can I ask, who, what is everybody in the audience? What are your credentials? What do you do? Are you professionals? Are you family members? I'm a child care teacher. Teacher? My son has characteristics of Asperger's syndrome. He's 25 now, but I work with children with special needs in daycare that I work at in 33 years, so I just thought that was really good. Very good. A lot of similarities, certainly with autism spectrum and fetal alcohol spectrum. How about everybody else? Speech and language therapist, teach language, and then she and said, We work with um, kids with mental health disorders. Okay. okay. Do you know I'm a mom of a daughter with Down syndrome and a teacher. I'm a um, parent of three boys that are on the autism spectrum, but I also have a master's in professional counseling. Um, I'm the mother of a 10-year-old. Um, my son I adopted, and he has a fetal alcohol, health, alcohol spectrum disorder. And I work at the Aging and Disability Resource Center, so I help connect 17 and a half year olds to the adult oh, adult Excellent. Very good. Thank you for coming. I'm a CLTS case manager for county funding, county viewer funding. Very good. Thank you. I'm an IRIS consultant, so I work with those that have a variety of different issues from ET through the health. Okay, very good. So, um, and, you know, fetal alcohol spectrum, similar to autism spectrum, is a spectrum diagnosis that begins at birth in utero, obviously for fetal alcohol spectrum. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about is a lot of the research is done in childhood, often when the diagnosis is made, but it continues through adulthood. So I'm kind of be, going to be going back and forth over the whole thing, things that apply to childhood, adolescence, and adulthood. I'm not going to take sort of each, um, each section at a time. Okay. Um, I do like to be interactive. I'm here to provide information for you guys. So if you have questions, comments, please feel free to jump in. Um, and we'll do what we can. I know we're kind of on a time schedule here, and I, I tend to go long, so I'm going to try <laughs> to do the best to get to the slides. Um, is there anything in, in particular, people? I'm, what I'm going to do is going to go through the diagnostic process, what the neuropsych and neuroimaging profiles look like, and then some pharmacologic treatments and behavioral interventions, and then provide some resources at the end. So that's reasonable? Okay. So you know, fetal alcohol spectrum, like autism spectrum, is a, it's a constellation of developmental disabilities that's caused by prenatal alcohol exposure that affects the brain's development. It is considered an organic brain disorder, so neurologic, neurodevelopmental condition. Um, it is not genetic. It is um, created, unfortunately, by um, exposure to alcohol, which is a teratogen and a negatively affects the brain development in a variety of ways. Okay? So it's a continuum of severity, intensity, and presentation of symptoms, okay? And that's true from childhood through adolescence into adulthood, okay? Um, it is a lifelong condition, um, and we're going to talk about that too. Uh, longitudinal studies looking at fetal alcohol spectrum disorders show that individuals are at greatly increased risk for adverse long-term outcomes, including significant mental health problems, and poor social adjustment, occupational difficulties, and involvement with the legal system. So research does show that early identification and appropriate diagnosis have been demonstrated to be protective against the more serious secondary disabilities that can develop in individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. 
So my hope is that with greater education and awareness, right, for people, uh, both family members, uh, educators, providers, as well as the legal profession, um, we can make some interventions that can uh, help people on the spectrum. So the degree and severity of the deficits that an individual who is exposed prenatally to alcohol uh, depends on a variety of factors. Uh, certainly the amount of alcohol that's consumed, the frequency of use, the amount at the frequency of use, right? The timing of the use during gestational period, whether or not the mother also was a smoker during pregnancy, um, the health of the mother during the pregnancy, factors um, of the genetics in both the fetus and the mother, um, uh, so age, health, certain obstetric problems that the mother can experience during pregnancy as well. So typically, um, a diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum, it has to be viewed as greater than light drinking, okay? And we're gonna talk about some limitations of that uh, diagnosis or the definition. That's defined loosely as one to 13 drinks per month with no more than two drinks consumed at any one time. However, I'm gonna be talking about research that indicates that in fact, even light consumption of alcohol causes symptoms uh, that meet criteria for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And in fact, there's studies that show that binge drinking, in fact, only one episode of binge drinking, which is five drinks of alcohol at one sitting, is enough to cause significant deficits, okay? So this is kind of viewed kind of loosely. This is our, our working diagnosis at the present time. Estimated prevalence and incidence of fetal alcohol varies widely across studies, depending on how, what symptoms they're using, what, how severe the symptoms have to be to meet criteria for that study. Um, but mostly they're in the range of, of two to five percent of prevalence in the United States. There are other countries, France and Africa, where there are much higher percentages, and from 40 to 80 percent uh, where high alcohol consumption occurs. Um, so those rates just vary widely, uh, both in the United States and globally. Uh, they also vary widely across um, ethnic and cultural backgrounds, right? A lot of ethnicities and cultures um, view consumption of alcohol very differently. And we know there are genetic contributions to how alcohol can affect you based on your ethnic background. So the American Indians um, and African uh, Americans especially individuals from South Africa have a higher incidence of uh, conferring a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So they have uh, some genetic uh, factors that make them more vulnerable to the negative effects of alcohol and becoming more addicted to alcohol, okay? Um, so American Indian population and African Americans um, in terms of uh, culture and ethnic uh, backgrounds are, are Lots of the research has focused specifically on those groups. Uh, the third group is Caucasians, a lot of studies, but other ethnicities are not as well uh, studied, at least in the United States. Um, about 50% of individuals on the spectrum for fetal alcohol um, display deficits within the first three years of life. And that means the other 50% um, can express those difficulties later in life. And as we know, that's true for autism spectrum as well, right? Um, if they're high functioning uh, on the spectrum, they might not come uh, to clinical attention or attention of caregivers or the school system, maybe until middle school or even high school when greater environmental demands are placed on them, okay? So it's important to keep in mind that just because that diagnosis wasn't made at birth or within the first three years of life doesn't mean it isn't present, okay? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, diagnosis, uh, prenatal exposure to alcohol results in higher prevalence of disrupted school, um, both attendance and performance, poor employment, trouble with the law, confinement either legal and or psychiatric, and remaining dependent in living conditions, so not being able to move into independent uh, living environment. More than 90% of individuals with a diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder have co-occurring mental health diagnoses. Most common, the research really reports the rates of 50 to 90 percent have a criteria meeting a comorbid diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is the current classification. 
uh, I'm going to use a, a variety of different terms, and I do have a slide, I think that explains some of them, but NDPAE, so it's a neurodevelopmental condition associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. So there's a variety of terms that have been used in the research and clinically to refer to fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. The current term, as you know, is fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Uh, the primary condition initially was fetal alcohol syndrome. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, so it is, there is really significant research that shows that even though such a high percentage of individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders meet criteria for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, the profile really is different. And I'm going to highlight some of those findings in neuropsych. Their response to treatment is also different. Um, so the characteristics are very different um, in ADHD with fetal alcohol spectrum versus ADHD alone although certainly similar parts of the brain are affected or involved. Mood symptoms, including a bipolar disorder, depression is the most common mood disorder, um, anxiety is also reported. Um, in addition, they have a much higher probability of being diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder, which if you know is a precursor, right? You have to have conduct disorder uh, prior to the age of 15 in order to have a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder as an adult, also higher rates of antisocial personality disorder um, and passive aggressive personality disorder in adulthood. Um, they have increased risk for themselves using tobacco, alcohol, and other substances as well. What exactly are the criteria for an opposition Very good question. So I'm going to repeat that. She asked us from her teaching background, um, what, are, what are the criteria for a diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder? So while I'm not going to get into, there are specific criteria, but her question is how do you differentiate somebody who meets criteria from ODD, oppositional defiant uh, disorder, from a normal teenager or child, right, with uh, these features, right? So maybe they have aggressiveness or they have certain features, but not all of it. There are full criteria listed. So I would recommend if you have any concerns, you want to send them to a professional, uh, such as myself, who can make a diagnosis, right, and look at all the criteria. So they have to meet all of those criteria, not just have certain features, right? Um, so thank you. But I, unfortunately, I don't have the time to get into the full criteria right now, but I can certainly talk to you after. Um, so our current diagnostic system is somewhat limited. So DSM-5 came out in the summer of 2013 after much controversy and uh, revisions and a lot of consensus diagnoses. Um, so what we currently are allowed to use as the clinical classification for any type of billing, insurance, um, IEPs, any kind of services or resources you need, the only classification we can use is the ICD-10 classification of F88, okay? And that stands for Other Specified Neurodevelopmental Disorder. And then you specify neurodevelopmental disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. So that's the current diagnostic classification. Okay? And there's really no criteria other than saying this applies to presentations in which symptoms characteristic of a neurodevelopmental disorder cause impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning predominate but do not meet full criteria for any other specified disorder, such as an autism spectrum disorder, okay? So it's pretty broad, right? So the DSM really is not very helpful in helping a clinician determine what the criteria are in terms of the diagnosis we can use, okay? Now, there is another section in DSM-5 called sections, uh, or excuse me, conditions for further study. Are people familiar with the DSM-5? So that's our current diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. So those are only diagnoses we can use and code 
um, for obtaining resources or for billing purposes. Yes. So when there is a condition for further study in the DSM, um, is it usually, um, I don't know, made official in the next version, or does it actually <laughs> take several cycles? How does that work? Some fall by the wayside and they're never to be heard of again. Some are reformulated based on current research findings and come out with a new title or similar title and then enter DSM. Some stay in that section and you don't know if people are doing research or not. Um, so any, anything can happen. Um, I am very hopeful. I think there's a lot of groups who are pushing for fetal alcohol spectrum to become its own specified disorder. It certainly got very close in DSM-5. Um, so I'm going to talk about what the diagnosis is in this um, newly proposed diagnosis because this is our working definition uh, for criteria for a diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. I, I'm not sure that I'm so attached to the name myself, but um, th they're proposing the name be, um, oh actually these are old names. Is neurobehavioral disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure? So that's the new proposed uh, diagnostic title. Really, right? Doesn't really roll off your tongue. And the difficulty I have is it doesn't fit with the other classifications like autism spectrum disorders. And the research field really is now latched onto fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So I don't know why that isn't the classification title. But in DSM 5, under the proposed, this is the new diagnostic title. Okay, so previously, terms that have been used in research are alcohol-related birth defects, say our BD, for individuals with birth defects that were believed to be associated with alcohol, but at the time, we only had fetal alcohol syndrome, so if you didn't meet the full criteria, you got birth defects associated with alcohol prenatally. Then, um, the term alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, ARND, um, came into fashion. That's been used quite extensively in, in research uh, publications. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I kind of like the neurodevelopmental um, kind of title, neurobehavioral disorder. I think you kind of lose the flavor that it really is a brain, a neurologic condition, right? There's documented structural brain changes, neurochemical brain changes, there's a pathology that we know where neuromigration is affected. So, I mean, it is an organic brain disorder. It's not just, you know, they, they're trying to subsume the neurologic part of the neural, but unfortunately when we do this, I feel like behavioral takes over and people more view it as a behavioral condition rather than an organic neurologic condition. Um, okay. So, newly proposed criteria for the neurobehavioral disorder. Um, you need more than minimal exposure to alcohol during gestation. Again, this is still controversial in the field, how much alcohol is necessary to meet criteria. Um, including pregnant, uh, prior, so including alcohol consumption prior to pregnancy. So there's some studies who look at alcohol ingestion prior to being aware that you were pregnant. And that alone, there's been um, significant findings in, in resulting in um, defects uh, to the infant. Um, so confirmation of gestational exposure to alcohol can be confirmed from maternal report, observation from collaterals, uh, some testing, medical records. So they have to have impaired neurocognitive functioning manifested by at least one of the following, and okay, there are five criteria. They can have a global intellectual impairment or comprehensive developmental assessment could be impaired, and that's compared to age, their age group, age peers, just like autism spectrum. Impairment in executive functioning, and we see that as, that's a very notable uh, field and uh, domain to be impaired in fetal alcohol spectrum. Impairment in learning, and even meeting criteria for a specific learning disability. Memory impairment, or impairment in visual-spatial reasoning, visual construction. Uh, those tend to be less involved, but I'm going to touch on those findings in the field as well. Um, they have to have impaired self-regulation. So this is a separate category from neurocognitive findings. Um, and one or more of the following three, either impaired mood or behavioral regulation, very common in fetal alcohol spectrum. Attention deficit, also very common, as we talked about. And impaired impulse control, all three of those 
deep criteria they have to have that result in impairment and adaptive functioning is manifested by two or more of these, but one has to be either one or two, okay? So one is a communication deficit, so either delayed acquisition of language, very similar to autism spectrum, or difficulty understanding spoken language, or two, an impairment in social communication and interaction, again, overlap with autism spectrum. There's been some, um, certainly, discussion in the field, in the research field in fetal alcohol spectrum about the overlap or differentiating fetal alcohol from autism. Um, but certainly the same parts of the brain are affected, so we're gonna see overlap as we do in a lot of other diagnostic categories. Uh, so one, uh, either one or two, and then it has to be at least one uh, of the others remaining. So impairment in daily living skills, so this could be, you know, delayed toileting, feeding, bathing, kind of managing personal care needs, managing their daily schedule, and then impairment in motor skills. Um, certainly most common is poor coordination or poor fine motor skills. Um, sometimes gross motor milestones are delayed, sometimes not. Um, but coordination and, and integration of motor skills is most common. And then, of course, uh, the final criteria, E, onset of the disorder has to be in childhood initially because it's obviously prenatal alcohol exposure, so we need to see the first signs prior to the age of 18. This disturbance has to cause clinically significant distress or impairment in one of the main domains, social, academic, occupational, or other important areas of functioning, okay? So these are, you know, the criteria that are used for all the other neurodevelopmental uh, disorders. And the disorder is not better explained by some other known condition, either a known genetic condition, okay? So we're gonna talk briefly about some overlap um, with known genetic condi conditions. Uh, Williams syndrome, um, Cornelia de Lange syndrome, those are known genetic conditions. Uh, VCFS, which is velocardiofacial syndrome. Um, lots of overlap with fetal alcohol. I'm gonna talk about those and then the differences as well. Um, and simply just effects of environmental neglect. So other conditions um, that need to be ruled out in order to make or confirm a diagnosis of fetal alcohol. Okay. Okay, I kind of talked about this. So uh, fetal alcohol syndrome was the initial condition that was identified. It's actually been talked about as far back as Aristotle, but papers really came out defining um, the, this current classification of fetal alcohol in the, in the early 70s, 1973, by Jones and others, um, that really that identified very clearly that alcohol had direct impact on the developing brain, on neuromigration, um, and a variety of other factors in cell development and where cells ended up in the brain. Okay, so we know there are neurochemical and structural changes in individuals with fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay? And there's a classification of specific areas that need to be mapped in order to meet the full syndrome of fetal alcohol syndrome. They have to have facial anomalies, growth retardation, and developmental delays and or mental deficiencies. So those are the three main categories that need to be met. Okay? And this is for fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay? There are currently four different but very similar diagnostic consensus schemas that are out there. There's a Canadian one, a Toronto, and uh, some others. I'm not going to go into those in detail. You can certainly look those up online, or I can get those to you if you'd like them. But there's significant overlap in what those symptoms are, so I'm going to highlight uh, the main areas that are needed. Okay, as I mentioned, the best profiles exist for Caucasians, American Indian populations, and African Americans. Uh, not so well defined for others like Asian populations. Um, these are the domains, so they need prenatal and or postnatal growth deficiency, and that's loosely defined as height and or weight at or less than the 10th percentile compared to same age peers. Central nervous system dysfunction, pretty broad category, okay? They can have structural brain anomalies, head circumference is at or less than the 10th percentile, so microcephaly, small, small head and evidence of neurological and central nervous system dysfunction, and that's the whole range of neurocognitive, neurobehavioral, and psychological uh, deficits that we see. And that's what gives range for a lot of the fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, okay? So a lot of, a lot of room in there, the CNS dysfunction. And then a characteristic pattern of facial anomalies, 
and that can change certainly with development. So those that have only mild uh, facial anomalies as, as children can you outgrow know, those. So that's not um, a strict criteria for the fetal alcohol spectrum uh, disorder diagnosis. Okay. So I'm going to touch just briefly on the facial anomalies. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, um, but this shows, these are a, a couple of kids, you can see American Indian, Caucasian, African American, you can see uh, the facial features. Um, the most commonly known, right, is they have this smooth or indistinct philtrum, you know, you got that kind of a dip with two edges there. So in the fetal alcohol spectrum, that tends to be non-existent or very smooth. Then they have this very thin upper lip, um, underdeveloped uh, or a jaw or micronathia, so the jaw is small, the over he oversized head overall is, is small, head circumference tends to be small. Another main finding is the epicanthal fold, so the, the crease on the inside tends to be bigger, and then the space between the inner and outer eye and then the space between the two lids tends to be smaller, okay, in fetal alcohol spectrum. Um, they tend to have more of a flat mid face, a flat bridge of their nose, and kind of a smaller upturned rounded nose. So that's kind of the general features. Um, they don't have to have all of those for the full diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome, and certainly not all of them for the diagnosis on the spectrum. Now I'm going to talk about the neuropsychology. Let's see if we're done. Okay. Um, does this go tell quarter two or? Yeah, okay. um, so neuropsychology of fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorders. So IQ tests alone are not enough to be able to make the diagnosis or differentiate those on spectrum from those not. So uh, from and uh, different from other developmental disabilities. However, in general, individuals who have been diagnosed with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders have lower full scale, that's the overall general IQ, typically falling in the low average to borderline range, although there is a percentage that falls within the range of uh, intellectual disability, formerly known as mental retardation classification. They also have significantly lower freedom from distractibility index, which is comprised of the working memory subtest. And you'll see as, as I go on, working memory is a huge problem in individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum, even in very mild uh, cases. So that's a big area that uh, has significant ramifications for their life. Um, children with heavy prenatal alcohol exposure, with and without physical anomalies, all had diminished intellectual functioning across the research studies. Okay. So doing that test alone as a neuropsych battery is not enough to differentiate, but certainly IQ helps us inform both the level of functioning for that individual, right, um, and then helps also with diagnosis in conjunction with the full battery. So research, in fact, has found a dose-dependent decrement that exposure to one ounce of absolute vodka, I mean vodka, sorry, vodka is actually my drink, <laughs> sorry, at alcohol um, per day, which is the equivalent of about two to three drinks per day prior to recognition of being pregnant, okay? So this is not even throughout the pregnancy. It was associated with a five point, this is five standard score points in IQ, even after covariating out the confounding, the influence that we know from 11 other predictor variables, okay? So factors of the mother, uh, age, other uh, factors that we know influence IQ, even taking those out, consumption of alcohol, even before the mother knew she was pregnant, had a significant impact in dropping five IQ points. Okay? Yes? Um, and that comes to the two or three dreams per day, the equivalent. Um, it's the same thing. So the drinks vary in an alcohol content. So right. we're talking about beer, water right. beer, and that's very important because when you are talking to women about the problem, that, or I only drink beer, or I only okay. have, a, I don't, I'm not a heavy drinker, and that's my exactly. Where no, she points out that there's a difference between types of alcohol, right? So a, a 16 ounce beer, right, is equivalent to a shot of um, tequila versus, you know, one shot in a mixed drink, 
right? So there's equivalencies, um, you know, online you can find what's the equivalency across different types of alcohol in terms of content. So one beer versus one shot, one glass of wine, which is really, you know, a half a glass of wine, which is the, the criteria. So certainly there are equivalencies um, and there's, uh, all alcohol is bad, and like I said, even though the, the, the current criteria list more than light, there certainly are research studies um, where they feel they have uh, mothers giving very reliable reports on what they consume during their pregnancies, have very light intake of alcohol, and have uh, significant ramifications for the fetus and then the, the child after birth. Um, this is because there's other factors that could be impacting that, right? I mean, if the mother is of poor health in general, doesn't not going to take much alcohol to influence the fetus. If she's also smoking, that has significant ramifications. Um, how much she drank and how much she drank prior to the pregnancy. So what is her physical health like? So there's a lot of other factors that play into that as well. Okay. Um, so really the goal for the fetal alcohol uh, society is abstinence. And even when trying to get pregnant is, is the best recommendation. Um, in addition, uh, so these studies are by Streiskuth uh, et al. He's a big uh, researcher in the field of fetal alcohol. This uh, study was published in 1989. Heavy alcohol exposure is also associated with decrement in both verbal and performance IQ. Lower prenatal alcohol the effects on IQ were much more variable, of course, because there's quite a range there of uh, intake. Um, across domains, fetal alcohol spectrum individuals perform within normal limits on simple tasks. So this is a cross cognitive domain. So in general, they perform fairly normally on simple tasks, but decrease much more rapidly as the complexity of the task across so visual spatial, visual perceptual, construction, motor, executive functioning, attention, planning, as those increase in complexity, those with fetal alcohol syndrome tend to show more and more deficits compared to their peers. Okay? So task complexity is a big uh, demand. Attention and information processing domain, uh, domains, as we talked about in fetal alcohol spectrum, are highly involved. Okay? So they typically have deficient performances on tests of vigilance, which is the ability to consistently maintain attention over time, over an extended period of time. And we test that both in the auditory and visual domains. Um, Mursky, uh, a researcher in, in, in the field in 1996, he proposed a model of attention. So not just for fetal alcohol, but for attention, how the brain processes attention. And his model, he found four domains, focus, sustain, encode, and shift, that describe what the brain is doing when somebody's trying to pay attention, right? So we have short-term attention, right, where you're just trying to hold something in working memory. Um, very simple attention where you're just, right, saying it once versus working memory, we might rehearse it in our minds. Focus, where we have to concentrate for a little bit more extended period of time. Divided attention, right, if you think of the classroom setting, you're listening, so auditory attention to the teacher, and maybe taking notes, so you have tactile and visual attention at the same time, so you have divided attention, maybe Joey's talking really loud next to you, so you, you got some attention distracted by that, right? Sustained attention over time, so a lot of aspects. So, and researchers in the field of uh, studying fetal alcohol effects have found significant differences in those with a diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum versus a diagnosis of ADHD. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of the similarities and differences, and that might influence why uh, some of the findings and why uh, the treatments don't work as well. Okay, so in fetal alcohol spectrum individuals, they found greater deficits in the encode and in the shift domains of attention. And these are the capacity to hold information in working memory and manipulate it to perform a mental operation on it. Okay, so as I mentioned, that's a big domain of the alcohol. Shift is the ability to shift attention from one stimulus or one aspect or dimension of a stimulus to another. Okay, so shifting also significantly impacted in with prenatal alcohol exposure. Okay, 
ADHD individuals had greater deficits in the focus and sustain. So the other two dimensions uh, of the attention classification by Mursky. So focus is the ability to concentrate, and then again sustain is the ability to sustain attention. Now there are other studies, of course, that have found deficits in sustaining vigilant attention, particularly in the visual domain, in individuals with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So it's not as clear cut, um, but overall, fetal alcohol tends to have more troubles with the code and shift, so it's more trouble, and ADHD more trouble with the focus and sustain in comparison to each other. Okay. Um, fetal alcohol spectrum disordered individuals are also worse on task requiring supervisory attention. So if you have to pay attention to something in this place, is heavy demands on working memory, and you have to make choices or make decisions or execute some level of control over what you're doing. Okay? So that is significantly impaired, and this is one of the reasons why um, researchers and clinicians um, feel that individuals on the spectrum have so much trouble in life and transitioning into adulthood. Um, right? This leads to planning, decision making, organizing their life, just managing day to day tasks. And then it's very, very difficult for them to do. So you can see even uh, deficits in one area can have significant ramifications for someone's life. But would you say that something like kids are um, supposed to be independent reading and maybe writing down a word they don't know and they start thinking about this or they see it snowing and pretty soon time is up and you no know, reading is happening, no words have been written down. Right. Would that be kind of it? It is, absolutely. Okay. Right? So what, what she mentioned is, would this be similar to, you know, let's say you give a child an assignment, right? Here you're going to have an independent reading time, which most classes do these days, right? And I want you to read, you've got 15 minutes, read this page, write down words you don't know and maybe something you learned about the character, right? And the child starts and then, time's up. And they got half a word written or half a sentence, right? This is right, the ability to self-monitor, self-regulate, and self-direct. So there are normal developmental periods when that a child gains that ability to do that. And it begins in first grade, really. There's a, a, a large developmental um, movement, I guess, going on in the brain between the ages of seven and nine when executive functioning, including the ability to self-monitor and use feedback. So the teacher might say, right, oh, well, Johnny, you didn't finish your assignment, you need to focus, right? Use that feedback to then self-direct and self-regulate. So that really happens around age seven, eight, nine, and they get better and better at that. And that is significantly impacted in fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Okay. Yes? I was just wondering if there's any research about like this diagnosis, like with autism or ADHD when actually it's really a fact fetal alcohol spectrum disorders? Yes, I'm going to hold that to okay. the end. That's okay. Remind me. Okay. <laughs> but yes, I'm going to touch on that. Um, okay, so, and then any working memory tasks, so, you know, we have simple attention, so citing digits four, where it says you have to do more working memory to recite a string of digits in the reverse sequence, or story, right, arithmetic story problems, where you have to hold it and figure out what, what actual calculation do I need to do, and, and then, oh my god, what's the, what was the, what was the information again, right, so very commonly impaired in fetal alcohol. Uh, and then really across the board and in both of these areas, carry into adulthood, okay? Significantly slower processing speed, this is also true of autism spectrum though, slower processing speed um, in comparison to uh, other comparison groups, okay? Especially uh, as the complexity of the information increases. Significantly impaired executive functioning, which is not surprising, we know that the frontal lobe um, is an area that's largely involved in fetal alcohol. It's uh, and affected significantly by prenatal exposure to alcohol um, and the subcortical connection, sub connections to the frontal lobe. Okay? So these include right complex problem solving, planning, judgment, monitoring of goal-directed behavior uh, in the face of both internal and external distractors, right? So just like you mentioned, you know, keeping yourself on track, on task, and doing what you're supposed to do, okay? Um, error correction, right? Being able to recognize if you made an error and correct that. And then shifting response sets, very, very uh, often impaired in fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. 
So these are some of the tests we use, mazes, trail making tests, constant trigrams, the Wisconsin hard swimming test, the set shifting, planning, um, decision making and problem solving tasks, measuring perseveration, the ability to shift set, right? Um, category tests, and abstract reasoning. Uh, <coughs> Uh, deficits and executive function, we're going to continue in this area a little bit. So planning and conceptual set shifting, uh, measures of fluency. So verbal fluency, typically more than the category fluency, okay? Uh, but set shifting is very important and it is highly correlated across some studies with behavioral problems, right? So think about that, that makes sense, right? If, if your brain gets stuck on something and you can't shift, or you're trying to do a problem, you're trying to solve a problem, and you come up with one solution, but that's not effective, and you tr your brain can't shift to see another solution, even if somebody gives you the answer, right? We're gonna talk about some of that research. But imagine how frustrating that could be, or how, how easy that can set off or trigger an aggressive or angry response, right? Because their brain doesn't allow them to be flexible, to think about and see and discover alternative, alternative solutions, right? So that is Adult version. 
um, is a test of verbal learning where you get a, a super span or a long list of words. The child's version has 15 words and the adult version has 16. And those words are semantically related. Although we don't tell the person taking the test that they're related. And I want to see if you can spontaneously organize those words into groups, right? Chunk. You can chunk your memory. You will learn faster and remember more over time, right? So we like to chunk information, associate it with information you already know. So on this test, you get five learning trials of the same words. So I give you the list. You tell me back what you remember. I tell you the list again, you tell me what you remember, I give it again, you tell me the words five times. You get a lot of repetition to learn. Then I give you a new list of words where I try to interfere with your ability to encode and store that information. So I want to see, did the fact that you learned all this information interfere with your ability to learn new information? And then I test your memory for the old information, so I want to see if after learning it, then I interfere, can you now remember trial five or did it drop? So that interference, right, is an executive component of memory, right, and regulated by the frontal lobe, so it can be impaired in developmental conditions. And then I come back approximately 20 to 30 minutes later and I assess long-term memory. So what got into storage? And there's free recall, so just what do you remember? And then there's recognition memory, where I give you a bunch of words, some of which are on the list, some of which are on the distractor list, and some of which are not on either list. And I want to see if you can discriminate what was actually on the list, okay? So, significant differences. So this group, we have a group of individuals with ADHD and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, okay? So there are two separate clinical groups, and then we have the CON as a control group with no known neurologic or psychiatric condition, okay? So, on the first trial, the three groups didn't differ, okay? Then on trial two and three, okay, the ADHD and the FASD performed significantly worse than the controls, and the ADHD is a little bit higher than the fetal alcohol, but not significantly different, but they're both significantly different than controls. So the controls are learning significantly more from trial one to three, and the ADHD and the fetal alcohol are not. Then, four and five, the ADHD gets up to normal. They're not different from controls anymore, but the fetal alcohol are different from controls all the way through to trial five, okay? So, over the trials, fetal alcohol spectrum learned a little bit each trial one through five, but significantly more poorly after trial three than the ADHD and across all trials compared to controls. ADHD Okay? So a little difference in learning, and you can see certainly in fetal alcohol spectrum, learning or the encoding of information is much more significantly impaired in the fetal alcohol spectrum than ADHD or neurotypically developing kids of the same age. Um, then on delay, controls performed significantly better than both the fetal alcohol spectrum group and the ADHD group. Retention was impaired only in the ADHD group. So for how much information the fetal alcohol got in, they were able to keep it in. But it was, the amount was less, but the percent retention was normal. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, now, in recognition memory, which is typically easier, I'm just giving you, was it on there or not? Fetal alcohol spectrum performs significantly worse than ADHD or control, so they, they can't discriminate actual from distractor words. Imagine how that can impact day-to-day -day functioning, right? So details from different events could be intermixed, right? If it sounded similar, maybe that's what they said, right? So there's lots of confusion and, and difficulty when people say information can get really confused. Um, and that it impacts a memory, right? So that, that's really important and that stands out in the fetal alcohol spectrum. Um, so overall, the fetal alcohol spectrum are impaired in learning and encoding, but have normal rates of forgetting um, based on what they were able to acquire, which is lower than normal, okay? Um, but they differed in uh, recognition memory. ADHD differed in the retrieval of memory, okay? Now, visual perception, visual construction, 
um, is not as much work uh, in the visual spatial domains. Um, facial recognition tends to be intact, not impaired in fetal alcohol spectrum, or is that something that often is impaired in autism spectrum disorders? Um, fetal alcohol spectrum individuals can have difficulty with visual construction. Uh, so the theory test of visual motor integration can be impaired. And when looking at um, constructing complex designs, there tends to be a, a difference in their ability to recognize the global versus the focal or local details of a design. Is anybody familiar with the Ray complex figure? So it's a complex geometric design and lots of details in it. But if you, if you look at it and you kind of look at a gestalt, you can see there are some bigger shapes that define the overall and then there's details inside. Some people see the global, right, see the big, you see the forest but not the trees, right? And some people see the trees and can't see the forest. Okay, so there's also one of the tests we use is we use the forest for the trees, I call it. So we have letters, so I might have a capital D, but it's made up of small Y's, okay? And so an individual fetal alcohol can see the D, but they can't see the Y's, okay? So they have deficits in the details. Okay? And it really is amazing. There's overlapping figures, and you've seen like the forest ground. If you look at something and then you look at it a different way, there's two faces, all of those kinds of things. So they have deficits in really, right, these are more complex visual spatial uh, integration tasks. So as tasks get increase in complexity, so like spatial memory is intact if you love alcohol, but spatial memory. There's a task that's actually a logical spatial memory task, so they have to remember, and first, first they just have to remember, um, they test, they test uh, the ability to remember objects, visual, and that tends to be in the normal range for fetal alcohol spectrum. Then they do a spatial array, a visual array. That tends to be in the normal range. But when they have to memorize a spatial array that's a logical pattern, that's when fetal alcohol falls apart. Okay? So as the tasks get more complex and put more demands on, fetal alcohol uh, spectrum individuals uh, can no longer perform those tests. And that's when they uh, start to separate from neurotypical peers. Okay? Um, they also can have specific deficits in number processing. Uh, the research is kind of unclear if this is really because of the a load on working memory or if there's actually a deficit in number processing. Um, so that's a little bit confounded. Another area which overlaps significantly with autism spectrum is social cognition and social problem solving. So fetal alcohol spectrum disorders display deficits in social skills, and these do become more pronounced as they get older. So they tend to write, differentiate much more from their peers if they're, if they're not learning and acquiring these skills, much like uh, individuals in the autism spectrum can. This leads to numerous secondary disabilities, right? So depression, right, social withdrawal, um, occupational difficulties. Um, so we talk about that. So they have difficulty. Now there's, there is some research that differentiates autism spectrum difficulties from those social difficulties that fetal alcohol spectrum disorders have. So the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder group did not show significant difficulty initiating social interactions or using nonverbal communication, right? They don't have a problem with face recognition. However, they did display, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, displayed socially inappropriate behaviors and difficulty with peers. And this is believed to be secondary to their significant problems with deficient self-regulation and their executive dysfunction. Okay? So they try to interact, but they don't do a really good job of it. Very reminiscent, right, of ADHD kids. Right? So they get over involved and they're too hyperactive, they get in your face and they, right, other kids don't want to deal with them and try to push them off. Fetal alcohol can be very similar to that. A little more social cognition. So they do display, there's a test of social problem solving, which is shown to uh, have global deficits in individuals of so fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Um, they tend to be less skillful in social information processing patterns and goal selection, okay? So, and then response generation. So there's been some really nice studies done and they looked at group entry situations. So this test shows, has video, little video 
interacting. So it's not just a picture of this, is this case happy or sad, right? Um, there are actually people interacting and the children that are asked some questions about the interaction. And some of them scenes are group entry, so joining into a group, like will you play with me or can I join in, right? And they're rated on response selection, so how um, effective was their choice, how they joined the group, um, was it aggressive, not aggressive, was it effective, not effective, so they're, they're rating these different skills, okay? And then there's pro, uh, provocation situations, right? So set up to maybe provoke you in, into a certain emotional response, okay? Um, and we find that individuals on the fetal alcohol spectrum are less skillful in these, the goal selection, response generation, so generating appropriate responses to the social situations, and the response evaluation steps, and I'm gonna talk about that in more detail. They also had difficulty in coding, attribution and response evaluation, and enactment um, in the provocation, okay? So now, these did improve with age, but even though they improved, they were significantly below the development of their peers. Okay? And this, these deficits were above and beyond those predicted by having low IQ. Okay? So they weren't explained only by that. So in this, the reason I'm going into this more detail because this relates to what happens in adulthood and adolescence. Okay? So fetal alcohol spectrum disorder children, they gave fewer pro-social goals and they had more inept goals than controls. Right? So the strategies they're using, they're, they're not effective, okay? But then when they're asked to rate that, oh, fetal alcohol spectrum children also generated a higher proportion of aggressive responses and a lower proportion of competent responses for their first response. So when the children were asked to then evaluate their own responses and others' responses, how effective do you think those were? And those with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, they evaluated competent responses as being less effective in convincing other children to let them play with them. And they viewed their own inept responses as being more effective in achieving the goal, even though didn't achieve the goal, right? So even in the face that they're not getting the feedback they wanted, they think they are, okay? So, and they also thought it was more effective in getting others to like them when in fact they weren't being effective, okay? In the group entry situations, they encoded and recalled, this ties in with the findings in verbal memory, right? So in social memory as well, they encoded and recalled less relevant information than controls. Again, this did improve with age, but not to the degree expected. In the provocation situations, those with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, they encoded and recalled less relevant information from the vignettes as well. And they were likely to attribute, less likely to attribute benign intent to the responses of other children as being hostile or ambiguous. Okay. And they evaluated actually competent responses as being less effective in getting the other children to like them. Okay. Controls were more effective in their ability to repeat a competent response and to do so with appropriate eye contact and tone of voice in comparison to those with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Okay, so you can see a tie-in, right, of, of the memory and learning problems and the executive dysfunction with their social skills deficits and how that plays in their ability to manage outcomes in real life. Okay, now the behavioral profile. We don't have time. I got enough battery, so keep going. I'm plugged into the wall, okay? So the behavioral profile we talked about, they can have problems with their uh, communication and speech, talking too fast, um, too much, uh, interrupting others, being difficult to interrupt. They have difficulties in personal manner, right? So disorganization, clumsiness. Significant emotional ability, right? Rapid mood swings, intense mood swings, overreacting to stimulation, motor dysfunction. Because my son has Asperger's, and I just keep thinking of him when you're just describing someone, just comparing. Oh, very good. Yes. But I mean, oh, the same sorry, part sorry, of the brain. When you think of neurodevelopmental conditions, and we talk about some of the overlap. Um, you know, all the letters, right? ADHD, ODCD, right? And, 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 and,
They're the same part of the brain, right? In neurodevelopmental conditions, the frontal lobe is the most significantly involved, right? In autism, we know the same thing, right? That neurogenesis uh, and the development of those regions of the brain, there's significant overlap. I'm going mean, mean, to talk about in the next slide here about um, some other areas that are involved in key levels. So there's slight differences and significant overlap in all of them. Okay? Um, poor academic, and we talked about that already. Uh, so we know really maladaptive uh, behavior, uh, uh, difficulties in social situations. They can have unusual physiological responses as well. Uh, hyperactivity, sleep disturbance, common. Um, and again, that's not only for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Um, I want to talk about just some signs that we can see at the different stages. So in infancy and early childhood, you know, at birth we can see some of the CNS dysfunction. They tend to have a lot of jitteriness, irritability. And you'll see irritability carries through adulthood. Um, significant, right, that short fuse irritability, very, very common in fetal alcohol spectrum. Um, aut autonomic instability. Hypotonia, uh, which is low muscle tone, slow habituation, so difficulty with learning and habituating uh, to new uh, information, low levels of arousal, increased levels of activity and disturbed sleep. Um, we already talked about deficits in attention, emotional reactivity. Um, another area that's been highly correlated um, is this, this term um, negative emotionality, or what some people call difficult temperament. Um, but that's been related to some findings in the fetal alcohol spectrum. Um, so, and I'll get to that, I think that's in the slide coming up. So, some of the psychological problems are directly related to the amount of alcohol that the mother is ingesting during pregnancy. Um, so, when a mother consumes pregnancy, or excuse me, consumed more alcohol during pregnancy, the more consumed related to increased rates of depression in the children. Okay? And that's even between the ages of three and six. Okay? So 19% of children whose mothers drank three or more drinks per occasion had depression compared to only 1% of similar, similar age neurotypical children. And then mothers of depressed children in general tend to drink twice as much as those with non-depressed uh, children, the mothers of children who are not depressed. 80% uh, of heavy to moderate alcohol, um, so the group that had heavy to uh, moderate to heavy alcohol exposure prenatally, 80% of them had insecure attachment development, so they didn't attach to their mother, where only 36% had insecure attachment in the light alcohol consumption group, versus, uh, and this was, this was even co-varying for socioeconomic status and ethnic groups. Um, in other groups, respectively, it dropped to 40% and 19% for middle class um, uh, uh, groups, socioeconomic groups. Okay? So you can see the more individual uh, the mother drinks during the prenatal period, significantly increased rates of getting depression, and this was in six-year-old children. In general, there tends to be a higher rate of psychological problems in females and young girls than there are in boys. Um, so, and this is even found in con controlling for other pre and postnatal factors. Okay. Um, on the bottom here, there is considerable evidence in the research that children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are at high risk for experiencing negative early life events. Okay? And of course, we know that trauma and other traumas um, in life have significant impact on development and our ability to function adequately and maintain our social roles as well. Okay? Okay, I mentioned that already. Okay, so overall, uh, the, these are research findings. This, these are all positive findings in the research on fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. They have increased rates of insecure attachment, irritability, depressive symptoms, depressive disorders, mood disorders, ADHD, ODD, conduct disorder, delinquency, anxiety, antisocial personality disorder, passive aggressive personality disorder, disruptive behavior, bipolar disorder, mania, suicide threats or attempts, panic attacks, psychotic disorders and thought disorder, alcohol misuse, binge drinking, alcohol use disorders, and substance abuse. Okay. 
Um, so we know from functional neuroimaging studies that the frontal lobe is significantly involved. So um, there's problems with the activation in the frontal lobes, but also the medial and lateral temporal lobes. Um, so we know that those parts of the brain, when they're engaged in these learning tasks while doing functional neuroimaging, are not performing the same um, as neurotypical uh, children of the same age. Okay, so parts of their brain are not being incorporated or they need more parts of their brain to do the task or there's hypoactivation in parts of the brain that are needed to do that task. Yes? Um, in your opinion, what is the most useful type of neuroimaging? Um, like there's spec, there's MRI, like right, what's so the most helpful? The, the question is what is the most helpful type of neuroimaging? And I guess that depends on for what. So there is no neuroimaging that's available for clinical diagnosis or use. So you can't say to your doctor, I think my child has speed level spectrum, can you get a spec scan or an MRI scan or a functional MRI? You can't get those clinically. Um, so you can get MRI scans, structural MRI scans, clinically, but only for certain diagnoses, right? So you're looking for stroke or tumor and certain infectious diseases, um, but they're not approved. Um, and I don't think they would even do them if you paid self-paid to get that. And so on an individual level, they're not diagnostic and they wouldn't be helpful. This is group data. So this is data where individuals with a known and agreed consensus diagnosis of fetal alpha spectrum have these findings, but on an individual basis, we can't say that an individual would show that. Okay? So it's they're not, not they're, they're not diagnostic in and of themselves, but they can show difficulties in different brain areas, or they could explain why you know there are struggles in certain areas based off the imaging on the brain, right? In groups, certainly. That's why we do the research. So the group data certainly has evidence, right, that there's structural changes, there's neuroimaging changes, that fetal alcohol spectrum is a brain disorder. Okay? So there's data, so this group data is very useful to show that and, and to show that it's real, right? That this exists and there are reasons, there are brain reasons to explain the resultant behavior that we see in these children. And that relates to if your brain makes you that, then you're not, are you responsible? Can you control that? How much ability do you have to control that, right? right. But on an individual basis, no, we can't get that data. Not yet. Okay, um, okay I'm going to talk just briefly. I talked a little bit about the differential diagnosis and pharmacologica. The slides, and those are going to be available to anybody who wants them. I talk about a lot of the research on the slides. I'm going to give you just a quick rundown. As you know, there are differences with ADHD and fetal alcohol spectrum, although fetal alcohol spectrum often has comorbid ADHD. Um, stimulants have been tried and are frequently used in fetal alcohol. In general, they don't tend to work as well as they do with people with only ADHD. However, in individual kids, they do work very well. Um, if you're going to choose a drug, the research is more supportive of dexedrine, um, which is dextroamphetamine, as the generic, versus methylphenidate, which is ritalin, tends to work better. So dexedrine, which is dextroamphetamine, tends to work better in fetal alcohol spectrum um, with the ADHD symptoms. Okay? Um, although there's some kids that benefit from methylphenidate with atomoxetine or stera added in conjunction. There's a lot of research also, I shouldn't say a lot, some research in, um, I don't know if that's dextroamphetamine, second generation um, antipsychotics um, and SSRIs are the antidepressants. Um, Risperdal is the most uh, studied and can be very effective in managing aggressive and the disruptive behaviors uh, seen in some combinations. Um, some of the medications like carbamazepine and lamotrigine uh, for use for seizure disorders also have been effective um, in some isolated studies uh, in uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder children. And then finally I talk about some uh, behavioral interventions and then I give some, uh, there's some resources that have been available from Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, it's articles that provide resources and information for families, so I'll put the slides of that. Um, so thank you very much. Sorry. Very much um, so my information is on here. Uh, please, if you'd like to copy the slides, you're welcome to email me. I don't know if I, um, I'm not sure how to get the slides, if they stay on the drive or if 
Tim is going to get copies, but... Most likely my dad and other resource managers that help set up this event will be sending out an email to everybody who has signed up and has put their email on.